So, it's been a while. It's been like a month of some change. Right. Probably like two months. Yeah, Happy New Year. Happy New facts, Year to everybody. Facts, yes. facts. Happy end of the season as well. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Bittersweet. 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 Used to uh, going to the playoffs, but... You I'm know, not, sometimes you got to give your body a little rest. Right. That's, you that's feel right. me? I'm not used to going to the playoffs. So that's <laughs> I, I, never, I never played in the NFL playoffs. Never so played or the NBA playoffs. playoffs mm. Or the MLB playoffs. Yeah, I never I never played in any playoffs. That's it. Yeah, Except so. like a conference tournament the first round. But anyway, yeah, my name is Patrick Godadina. It's your boy Brian Ford. This is D1 Bound Podcast Episode 4. Today we got a very, very special guest. Um, someone's actually still playing. In the NFL, so Bless. wanted to go over you know some of the things that he's been through in his whole student athletic experience. Obviously, getting to some of the professional experiences as well. Um, but start off at called the King School, yeah. right? Silas taught me that because I was, it was I know it was a like King Low. It started it started like off that. King King in Low Haywood Thomas. There you go. School, see, but I not messed a, it up. But that's the reason they switched it up. So he called me the he told me yeah. it's the King School. So yeah. Went to. The, the King School mm-hmm. up there in, in Connecticut. Um, then went to Boston College. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. Um, and I'm not sure the timeline. I'm not certain on. I think he played. Was it at the at the Seahawks first? Seahawks. Seahawks. Kansas first. City. Kansas City. Kansas City. Yes, sir. Currently with the New York Jets. Mm-hmm. All right. That's that's a blessed career so far. And so we're far. Still going. Yeah. Uh, we want to welcome Kevin Pierre Lewis. So, happy to have you here, my let's brother. get into it. Appreciate it. Very, you. very happy to have you here. So I'm not sure. Are you at all familiar with our show and kind of the things that we get into? Um, a little familiar. You know, I've I've watched a couple of the other podcasts. Um, saw you guys doing great. So obviously had to come and show love. Thank you. We you know appreciate what I mean? it. For sure. Appreciate, appreciate you. It. Facts, you know it. facts. You know it. <laughs> so just for the people who might might be the first episode watching, we try to get into firsthand experiences of student athletes, mm-hmm. former student athletes, because um, we feel that everybody, no matter if it's Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, if you happen to make it to the pro levels, has had a unique experience. So that's really what what we want to get into. Some things. Uh, talking about recruitment, just your experience mm-hmm. in high school, college, that kind of thing. Because, um, like I said, we feel like everybody had a unique experience. So it's good for other athletes to hear what other people went through because they think, wow, is this just me? Um, and also people from the outside looking in that maybe aren't athletes themselves, mm-hmm. but, you know, they're fans of the sport or right. just of, you know, NCAA in general. So, they, you know, want to give them some kind of idea of what that's been. So first off... You know, if you could just give us a quick walkthrough of your one-page athletic resume. Well, okay, quick little walkthrough. Um, started off at King Low Hill with Thomas. Now it's called the King School. Um, started going there in seventh grade. Um, shout out to Silas. Silas actually helped me out get into the school. Um, but from there, played football, basketball, baseball. Switched over to lacrosse, getting into high school. Um, and then pretty much kept it to football and lacrosse in high school. Did fortunately well at both. Um, ended up getting recruited to Boston College. Mm. Committed there early as a junior. Was a, mid, was a mid-year guy. Mm. You know, started off four years. Was a blessing. Uh, showcased my skills there. And that propelled me to the NFL. Was drafted by Seattle mm-hmm. in the fourth mm-hmm. round at the linebacker position. Um mm-hmm. It was great, man. Played my first three years there. Yep. Was blessed enough to get traded to Kansas City. Got traded there. Played my year, finishing my rookie contract. Went into free agency uh, and made the best decision of being close to home uh, with the New York Jets. So, you know, that's it's pretty much that one page summary one right page. there. What that's I was getting that's what we just getting started. For Hopefully sure. we got another... Seven years, <laughs> ten years, and we talked yeah. to you in 2029. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and you come back we and do tell the, us we all the year challenge. Yeah. Right? Head, year head challenge. In, heading right. into year six, which is a blessing, man, because, right. you know, um, a lot of people don't make it right. this far. A lot of people just don't make it, and it's not even because of talent. Sometimes it's just opportunity. Right. And, you know, I was blessed enough to have opportunity show, and I answered. Mm. Um and so it's going into year six, and we'll see how it, how it goes from that from that point on. Mm. So yeah. we we heard from, uh, or we, you know, we're familiar with a couple other people that sure. you know play in the professional levels of 
not just football, but also basketball. And we've often heard that the goal really is to get past the rookie deal. Right. <laughs> like, to get to that second contract, yeah. that's to show that, like, you know, you're kind of there, you belong, that kind of thing. You feel that way? Yeah, no, for sure. Because it's, it's not just um, getting to that second contract, because there's a lot of things like pensions and, right. you know, getting your 401k. That's the important stuff to making sure that you have benefits when you're done. Because this game is is yeah. something serious, man. A lot of us, you know, we've been playing since we've been little. Tackle football, mm -hmm. you know, it's wear and tear on your body. So yeah. when you're able to reach a certain point when you can get these benefits back, yep. all that you've given to this game, it's a, a blessing. Yep. All right. It's a Cause, blessing. Because it can end like that. I mean, I've watched personally probably five guys. I've seen their careers in one play with my own eyes. With the neck injuries, concussions. You know, um, bad ACL tears, Achilles. And I remember in practice one time, I saw two tight ends tear mm -hmm. Achilles, play after play, seven on seven. <laughs> now, you know, Set, what's, hype. You know what's Done. funny? <laughs> Is that, like, we got a whole group chat with our friends, yeah. and we'll be watching games. And as bad as it is, we'll see somebody get injured. And somebody, like, if it's a really bad injury, somebody posting a group chat, never career. Yeah. Like, the word career, never like I said. I'm never watching. You Never. know what I mean? So, definitely familiar with that. But, yeah. like we said, obviously you are fortunate to get to that next level nice. of the next level. Um, so, we'll get into that kind of further down. What we really want to focus on, like I said, was the student athletic experience. Mm -hmm. So, as you mentioned, you know, kind of starting very early, having some experience in multiple sports. If you just walk us back, you know, you starting to play football or you starting to play other sports, you know, how far back do you Matt, do you remember? You know, you even competed. Um, and I've been competing since I was a kid, pretty much. Um, grew up in Norwalk, Connecticut, uh, not in the best of areas. So, what got me into playing sports was my father. Mm. He pretty much didn't want me running around in the neighborhood following my peers um, that didn't have anything else to do. So, you know, sometimes idle minds a man's worst enemy. So he made sure my mind never stayed idle. So. Whatever was in season, I played. Football season, played football. Basketball season, basketball. Baseball, summer, AAU. Making sure I was never running around. So I just always played sports, um, which definitely helped me out because my free time, I spent a lot of time on the computer. All he cared about was school. Okay. So as long as I had my schoolwork done, yep. play all the sports I want, play on the computer, do whatever I need to do. So I was just fortunate enough to be a competitive kid, to mm -hmm. grow up in an area that was a little rough, so you had that little edge on your shoulder. So when you competing, you just doing what you're doing back at home. Right. So everything Absolutely. came natural. Absolutely. Um, and that just carried me carried me on because I never really had pressure from my father to play. He always told me if I wanted to stop playing right. any day, he wouldn't care. You know, all he cared about was school, schoolwork, gotcha. schoolwork. There was a time I uh, I missed the homework assignment. Mm -hmm. He made me stand, I'll never forget that day. He made me stand up in front of my baseball team and tell them why I couldn't play that day. Wow. Ever since then, I made sure I just schoolwork, 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 which has helped me to this okay. day. Yeah. Got it, got it. Okay, so definitely, like you said, had a couple different sports mm -hmm. going on. Um, if you could walk us through, I guess, the kind of transition, right? Because at some point, you start figuring out maybe this is something that either you're just a lot better at or something you just enjoy more or whatever. Um, what was that? How did that turn out? Like, because, you know, from what I understood in high school, you, you played some mm -hmm. of lacrosse as well. Mm -hmm. You played some basketball. But, you know, obviously you ended up, you know, playing Play football, football to this day. Um, what, was, what was that like? You know, either you playing in middle school or playing in high school to kind of – single it out like I'm going to be a football player. Yeah, definitely. Growing up, uh, basketball was my, my best sport. It was my favorite sport. I love ball. It was honestly the only thing that I truly stepped on the court and I was confident. A little cocky with it. Right. Like, it was the only time I stepped on, I'm like, you knew it was on. Yep. I'm, I'm really about to do my thing out here. Um, and so playing these different sports helped me out in each. You know, playing mm -hmm. defense with basketball helped me playing defense in lacrosse, helped me playing defense with uh, football, so playing all these different sports allowed my mind to adapt quickly to whatever circumstances was thrown at me. Mm. Um, so going to King, 
uh, was a blessing because I even got to play basketball um, on a varsity level in eighth grade. Wow. Now, this was a blessing in disguise right. um, because no disrespect to the head coach at the time, I'm not going to say his name, but he ruined basketball for me. Like, that was my love. Mm -hmm. He pretty much ripped the love and the fun that I had for basketball in that year. And so after that, I played one more year in high school. I think it was sophomore year, but I stopped playing. So now it's just football and lacrosse. Now, I wasn't thinking that, you know, it was never a goal of mine to reach the level that I am right now. My goal was always to, I wanted to play at a college, on a college team that had the last names on the back of their jersey. Because yep. oh, I wanted wow. to represent my family. Mm. That's always been goal number one. That's hard. You know what I mean? Um, and so going through the process, um, I ended up moving in with my high school football coach. And seeing how hard he worked with the recruitment process, getting certain kids that didn't really have that name behind them, right. didn't have the school behind them like mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. to be able to go to Dartmouth, you know, be able to go to UPenn, Princeton, all these different schools. So to me, that was the ceiling. Right. I said, I'm going to Ivy League. Right. Perfect. I'm going to help my father out, make sure I'm doing well in school, and then I'm going to get a great education, and then that's going to be it, be it with football. Okay. Um, but obviously, it didn't turn out that way. Right. And, you know, going through high school, doing well, obviously one of the best in the league, um, going to the Boston College football camp. That's when I really started to figure out, like, okay, yeah, I'm humble. I compete. I work hard. But I'm definitely a step ahead of a lot of people right, right. now, you know. This is a time where everybody around the nation is coming. Mm -hmm. You know, you got the dudes from Florida, yep. Maryland, um, Cali, you know, everybody. Yep. Now it's not just private school where dudes think, oh, you're just doing well in private school. Right, right. Now I'm competing and I'm beating this next man that's supposed to be that guy right, right. now. And so, you know, it, it definitely raises your eyebrow like, yeah. can you actually do this? You know, you always question yourself coming from certain areas that's not big on football. It's like, yeah. can you actually do this? Can we you actually that. achieve yeah, that? We, 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 asked, we asked Silas, mm -hmm. we asked Ray, we asked Shadi the same question, like, when you were going to these camps, did it drive you that much more because you were coming from a state that like isn't necessarily known for football? Meanwhile, you got these kids from Texas, from Florida mm -hmm. coming in that the same way you feel like you were walking onto the basketball court, like knowing like I'm about to show out. I feel like that's just ingrained in them coming from yeah. those states. So as soon as they get to a camp, they feel like, oh, they know where I'm from. So I already got the leg up. Exactly. How'd that drive you? And yeah. was it just at the camp level or was it? Every day in and out of practice, when you when you competing in your in your league games, like how did that really drive you? It made everything personal, mm -hmm. um, and it it became about me, right. and that's what I excelled at. Because right. when something becomes about me, mm -hmm. everything's on my shoulders. Right. You gotta keep pushing for you know. Right. I'm I'm looking at the man in the mirror, so I'm like, now you challenging the man that I am. Right. Forget football. Right. Forget competing. Yeah, 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 all that. Yeah. You challenging me as a person, so right. that. That helped me drive, you know, and having my boys there, Silas, Eric, right. and a couple other guys go to these camps, you know, yep. we definitely looked at each other like, no, regardless of, let's just say if these guys are better or not, don't right. come and disrespect right. the work that we yep. put in, Absolutely. you know, because hard work is hard work. It don't matter what state you're from. It don't matter what area, how you grew up, right. from the nicest area to the, the poorest area, mm -hmm. work is work, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's going to show you the same results if you put that work in. Right. Um, so it definitely put that little that little edge, you know, when when dudes starting to hear that, you know, the coaches are talking to you a little mm -hmm. bit more. Mm -hmm. You rushing first to be in front of the line. Right. They start to hate. Right. It's it, you hear a lot of snickering. Oh, he ain't even that nice. Right. He ain't even that right. fast. But that's when you know you got him. Right. Absolutely. And that's and that's what made it perfect. You know, I lived for that moment. It wasn't about football. It's just about proving doubters wrong. And you come from a state like Connecticut, especially playing football. Right. You have nothing but dollars. Like, y'all don't play football and seats. I still hear it now. Right. You know what I mean? Talking to locker rooms like, man, we had this and we had this many people in, in our school. I'm like, but I'm where you are right now. Right. How'd that make you feel? Right. Walk off. Perfect. That simple, man. So it was just being a little bit of underdog just mm -hmm. helped a lot of us. And now CT's starting to get that little light. The whole tri state area, first and mm -hmm. foremost. Mm -hmm. Starting to get that little light, so it's, it's a blessing to yep. kind of keep that ball rolling. That's that's crazy. Did you feel the same like once you got? I guess what's the difference? Like you say, you still get that conversation now in NFL locker room. Mm -hmm. 
obviously you get it in high school where like people, everybody's a little bit immature. Like people, th- they don't really like you. Sixteen, seven, you don't really know shit. Like, yeah. Did you feel that same type of transition when you got to the college level? And it was you're playing at BC, so like you're still in the Northeast. Yeah. But it's still like yep. you, you still got the. It's a bunch of a lot of kids that that are coming from prep schools, that are coming from private schools, mm-hmm. that aren't coming from those powerhouse big high schools that are selling out in Texas and Thursday, Friday nights. Like, how did that compare to the conversations that you're having now in the NFL locker room? So what was a blessing about going to college and not the transitioning to getting ready for college was at this point, you know, we had all the rivals camps. Yep. We had um, all the recruiting process. So you kind of, you kind of got graded out. Right. So I was one of, I think, two, maybe three, four-star recruits Mm -hmm. that Boston College had. Right. So fortunately, I stepped up in there. They already had an expectation for me, you know? Um, And so going there, it it wasn't as bad because dudes already knew, okay, he can at least do something. Now let's see what he can really do. Right. Um, And at that point, just like anybody from this area, as long as we get that door open for us, the sky's the limit of what we can do. It's just a lot of times coming from this area, we don't get that door to be open for us. Right. Or if it's open, we got to push it open. Right. But now it was already open, so right. everything was in my hands at that point. But the craziest thing that I did realize when I first got to college was how truly it was about opportunity. Mm-hmm. Because in those first couple practices, I remember practicing, and no disrespecting to my teammates, I'm happy that they were able to make it there, some of them. But I mean, I'm like, man... I know a couple dudes back home that's way better than him. Right. But he didn't get that shot. Right. And it was crazy. You play against dudes. Like, you you a Division One athlete? Mm-hmm. I know a bunch of people back home that it's not always about skill. Right. You know? Right. And I think that's what the youth needs to realize, man. You got to keep working because if you keep knocking on doors and they're closed, one time that door will be open. And right. if you're not ready to take the opportunity, you won't have the opportunity again. What's, what's the quote? It's like a... The, the opportunity of a lifetime and, a op, and the lifetime of an opportunity. Mm-hmm. For some people, that lifetime of opportunity is big. Right. And for others, it's going Someone's like that. Like this. You know what I mean? Back. So it was just, it was, uh, it was crazy to, to recognize all that, you yeah. know, and, and start to learn that, you know, you do belong. Yep. You are nice. You can do this. Mm-hmm. And so once you get that confidence, you have to roll with it. You got to keep pushing no matter what happens. Got you. So, I mean, everybody knows that you're nice, so we don't got to talk about that too much. We know that you, oh, I'm not talking about nice. me. I'm just saying, <laughs> like, in you general. Right now, you're nice. Yeah, you yeah, acknowledge yeah. that. Um, but just to lighten it up a little bit. Um, so, to take one one baby step back, you know, obviously we talk about you playing different sports. Um, but even just with football, we understand people that usually take it to the next level. They're able to compete at a couple of different positions just because mm-hmm. maybe it's just your athleticism or your speed or whatever the case is. Um, you know, right now you're playing a, a lot of, I would say, special teams, mm-hmm. kind of linebacker-ish position. Yeah. Going back, do you, you know, were you playing other positions as well? And, you know, you know what brought you to, you know, what you're doing right now? Uh, play fullback and running back growing up. Um, in high school, Silas was a, the tailback. I was a running back. Uh, we both did our things for sure wow. at the running back position. But, you know, to me, man, sports and football was never just – I never saw it truly as a way out. So it was never something that, you know, I didn't put all my eggs in that basket. You know, I just it was just something that I did. Mm-hmm. So when it came to positions that I played, I happened to be fast. I worked hard, played running back. Play linebacker. I've always been a guy, you tell me where to go, I'll go, I'll figure it out from there, you know? So there was never a point where I was growing up like, man, I'm, I want to be a linebacker one day. I'm going to be a running back right. one day, you know? Um, as I said off air, you know, Boston College first saw me at wide receiver. Coach Ryan Day, right. yeah, which was crazy. Because right. I remember Cy had just picked up his offer. Mm-hmm. Um Next thing you know, they're talking about, it. hey, I've been seeing this other kid. Right. And Coach Ryan Day was constantly talking to me. Um, and they were trying to get me for wide receiver. Then uh, Bill McGovern, who was a linebacker's coach, said, actually, I've been watching this dude as well in my linebacker group. And next thing you know, they offered me from, from that. 
Um, so I pretty much had to choose, like, am I going to try this wide receiver thing? I'm going to play linebacker. I was like, I guess I'll play linebacker. You know, I really, truly didn't know, man. So you know, everything that's come my way has just truly just been a blessing. And I just kept playing linebacker and figuring it out from there. That's yeah. awesome. How, how important do you think that is for any of the, like, for the youth these days? Like, we talked to, to Shadi about how Michigan was recruiting him as an athlete. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily to play a specific position, but they knew his ability as an athlete where they can just, like, pop him in a different position in a, and say, this is how we want you to play. Do something. Right. Do you think far too often there are kids that are growing up that put too much pressure on them to play a specific position as opposed to being that versatile to be able to say, like, oh, th this is the system that I'm in. This is where the team needs me. This is how I'm going to excel. Because I feel like that's something that worked in your favor. Mm -hmm. And even now, like, you can still play multiple positions – and that is what I feel like keeps some people in the league. So Definitely. how important do you think that is for, for kids to really be, to, to know the game, learn the game, be able to play not just one position and focus on it, but be an all-around football player? I would say it, it starts with um, when you're that young, just you have to understand that you're still growing right. mentally and physically. So you don't know what you're truly capable of. You might be young, you're playing quarterback, you can throw it. Right. When we were all young, shoot, we was all trying to throw yep. 50, 40 yards, yep. you know what I mean? Um, so start off with what you truly believe in your heart. Because if you believe you want to be a quarterback and that's what your heart's telling you, right. then go do that. Mm -hmm. But understand that there still might be another possibility for right. you, you know? Is your heart telling you that you want to be a quarterback or you want to be a football player? Right. Because if your heart's telling you you want to be a football player, then be ready to transition mm -hmm. to what your, your situation is telling you to contribute transition to because i because i feel like there's sometimes where people let their pride get in the way mm -hmm. and if a coach says like hey listen like i think we you can be better utilized at right. the running back position as opposed to or make it well, i feel like what happens far too often is guys that think they're they're wide receivers but don't have hands mm. and Jeez. then the coach says that they they want to put them on defense and it's a shot to their pride and and they just lose the drive yep i feel like that's something that I mean, we, we do see it a lot, but it's mm -hmm. something that it's important. Like to be able to to be able to take that criticism at such a young age and just transition and say, all right, all right well, now I'm going to exceed at this position. Yeah. So you just, you just have to go back to finding out why you're doing it. Right. You know, as I harped on earlier, you know, things became personal, mm -hmm. and that's what I excel. When you make something personal about me, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep pushing forward. Right. So when a, you have a coach that might say, hey, I actually want you to play defense. Mm -hmm. You can't allow something so small take away right. pretty much everything that right. you've done everything work, you work for. for yep. You know what I mean? It's You have to go back to your drawing board like, okay, why am I doing this? Right. Why, why do I truly want to do this? Is it to get an education? Is it to make it to the league? Yep. Maybe that man that's done watch more film mm -hmm. hours than I've been alive, he might actually know right. something better. He might actually want to put me in a position to excel. True. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying every coach is the best coach, but there are some coaches where they're truly looking out for your best interest, man. They done seen this game. They done played this game. They done, yeah. they done did what we trying to do. Yep. I hated my high school coach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to this day, I don't like him. <laughs> and then, like, my while I was in college, up until I said maybe my junior year, yeah. I didn't like my college coach. Everybody had the stories about him that he was... I'm not even gonna say, but then he, he was just not a nice dude. Mm -hmm. He was a white guy, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody said he was racist, and For like, sure. but it was like everybody on the team was black. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like, how racist could he be? You know yeah. what I mean? But that's kind of just the reputation that he held. So the first couple of years, I went to that as well, and I'm like, he never actually said or did anything racist. That's not it. He just maybe isn't a nice dude. But it took me a while to, to get around to that as well and saying, like, he might know what he's talking about. Yeah, man. To, just to the, to the youth out there, to the young athletes, mm -hmm. and we're, we're older now, we're starting to realize, man, just we can't show up thinking that we know it all, yep. you know? A lot of times, you know, a lot of, especially nowadays, a lot of these kids are starting a lot younger than we did with this training, with all this other mm -hmm. thing. So you give them this wealth of knowledge so early, mm -hmm. they think, Oh, that's not what my trainer had me doing. I ain't about to do that. Right. You know what I mean? Just understand there's different ways to success. Not everybody's written the same book to right. success. Each person has had their different little route that they took.
you know. So the youth, we they have to understand that that it might not always be the smoothest, but if you work hard, you believe in your heart where you're gonna go, you're gonna get there, or you're gonna get to something where a door will be open in another venue because of the work that you put in and the thing that you love. You know what I mean? So you just gotta keep pushing. Believe believe in yourself first and foremost, because your heart's gonna bring you there. You know what I mean, if you live and right, you doing what you need to do. You're gonna be able to weed through all the BS, and you're gonna be able to push. You know I mean? So you talked about how originally you recruited as a wide receiver. Mm-hmm. What was that process like once you got to BC? Of were you still like trying to figure out like what role you were gonna play within the program? Like obviously you knew like you were one of a couple four-star recruit so you knew you were going to be on the field definitely did you feel like they were still like trying to test you out to figure out where you were going to fit in the system did you feel like it was all right well we looked at you as a wide receiver before but now we want you on defense like how did that all work out so throughout when i finally committed Mm -hmm. so i committed going into my junior year of high school um so by the first practice of junior year going to boston college um but so through that, it was already decided gotcha. I'm playing linebacker. Hold on. Did you have one of those sign days where you had the cameras and you had the four hats? Nah, I'm and good. you picked the, yeah, you picked the Boston College hat? Did you do that? Or that's, that, that's some new age? Nah, did, people were doing that, that during <laughs> okay. that time. But, man, it's, that just wasn't me, bro. <laughs> right, 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 that right. just wasn't me. I just, I never been a person about, you know, no disrespect. I never been a person about the limelight like that, you know. Gotcha. Never okay. wanted, oh, look at me type of thing. Um. So it was when um so when going to Boston College, we already knew that oh, I'm gonna play linebacker. Yep. So, you know, I was a mid year guy. Yep. First day I stepped on campus was January eighteenth, two thousand ten. Sure. I'll never forget that day, you know. Just loaded up the car, dropped off in the dorms. Yep. You know, I thinking they about to chill me for a little bit. It's like, all right, well we out. The door closed, I'm by myself in the dorm, you know, it's it's, I'm early, so a lot of the other students right. aren't there right now. Right. Um, but going through the process, you know, early on, it was trying to build my confidence. Do I belong here? Do right. I belong here? That imposter syndrome. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I didn't, it really didn't click for me until fall camp. Gotcha. I went through spring ball. I was the second string Sam linebacker. I'm learning defense now. Right. You know, you go from depending on the program you go from, you might go from a high school program where you're expected to make every play. Mm-hmm. You do anything. So you don't have a true responsibility. Right. Now it's different when you play at a division or you play at a college level where mm-hmm. everyone has a job. Right. And I had to learn that. Like, Kev, don't try to make that play over there because you're going to leave someone out to dry that needs your help. Right. It's not about making everybody, every play. It's about being together as a team. So that was a tough transition for me personally, going from the man, got to make every play, or feel as though I have to make every play to, yeah, you're good, but everybody else is right. good you around you. The, Do man. your job. You just got to be the man at your role. Exactly. And it might, you might not make the play. Right. But you help somebody right. out. You could help somebody you know make I mean? the play. Or, yeah. Yeah. So that was a, a huge, huge learning curve for myself and just learning the defense. Before it was line up, right. see ball, get ball. Now we cover two, invert, right. we got to check, oh, they in right. 11 personnel, we actually about to run this, whoop de whoop. Right. So the game just, just got blown up. You know what's crazy? <clears throat> I'm not. <laughs> I don't even know what he's yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what he's well, I, hope, I hope y'all know where I'm going with this. So I never played football in my life, right? Okay. So when people start talking about... When you said you played yeah. the Sam position, I had to look that up before. Yeah, right? no doubt, no worries. There's a Sam and there's the Mike, right? Yep, and there's and a Will. Right? And there's a Will. But then right? it's like, it's different defenses. <laughs> like, but yo, bro, it so goes crazy, about, dog. We playing 11 personnel. <laughs> bro, I'm sitting here, I'm nodding. <laughs> you like, okay. I'm like, all right, okay. back. <laughs> but I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what done in the half. So if they say go get it coming too, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yo, listen, when you coming to, we in three, five, four. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me nothing, bro. Tell me nothing. Listen. Did y'all like, make the play or not? Listen, like we like y'all got when the my experience with football. Yeah. When I was ten years old, eleven years old, was like, all right, we got eight. Y'all got eight. That was it. 
Facts. Like, yeah. no, like, facts. Oh, facts. Facts. That was facts. it. I don't know nothing else. We called seven yeah. Mississippi and we was out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yo, it was seven Mississippi. Like, sweet so boy. Yeah. So, That's crazy. Nah, like the. <laughs> but it's, it's funny because, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm just not as familiar with a lot of the. the the details of the game, um, but it's it's crazy you say that because um, I mean I was talking to one of my friends, uh, Brianna Brown, another Connecticut uh, prodigy, she crazy at ball. Um, I never going in college and college team talking about oh yeah they watching film. Right. I'm like it's basketball. What you watching film for? Right. You know what I mean. So to me in my head I'm like, what's so complicated about that? You know what right. I mean. But obviously there's a lot more. That people don't know. So if you if you don't know about that field like that, some things just aren't going to make sense. Exactly. So you could, we could talk about ball here. I'll just be here just sitting back like, all right, for sure, for sure. Like me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, then he hit the three. I saw that. I saw that. You know what I mean? Okay. So I, I definitely could feel that for sure. Gotcha, I definitely gotcha. could feel that. <clears throat> so I don't want to keep taking steps back, but just I want to take – it's the basketball Again, on you. One, <laughs> listen, you know, Stephen, right? you don't need to one, one back. Because, uh, like I said, we know that you went to, to Boston College, mm-hmm. but we wanted to kind of focus more on that whole process. Yes, sir. Right? We know that you went to a camp there, and, you know, you got offered a, a scholarship, I guess, at the camp. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, but before that, just looking, at, I think it was at your rival's profile still up there. I believe it was Duke, mm-hmm. Syracuse. Stanford. Stanford mm-hmm. that was up there. And they also had Notre Dame, and Notre Dame didn't State. have the offer. Mm-hmm. Um, just walking us through, I guess, because you said it was your junior year, earlier junior year that you actually committed. Um, you know, did you go to those other campuses? Did you actually visit? Um, and if you did or if you didn't, you know, going to Boston College, making you make that decision there, you know, was there something that said, like, All right, Boston College is it? I need to go there. So for me personally, my recruiting process, I started off with life after football. So the school that I wanted to go to was a school where I knew I was going to get a great degree and I was going to be able to do something with that. Right. Um, and with me committing to Boston College early, a lot of schools were like, pretty much, we want you to decommit before we give you this offer. You know, Notre Dame was one of those schools. I remember oh, a dude okay. told me, he said, that makes sense. You decommit from Boston College, we get you, we'll throw you this offer, you know? Um, but with my thought process, a lot of schools weren't even in the picture for me, you know? Um, you know, I went to the Penn State camp, um, went to Temple camp. Um, you went weren't to, going to Penn State. Wasn't that gonna, camp was probably crazy with Sandusky in there, right? At the time, it wasn't. It wasn't lit. But the crazy thing, <laughs> actually, you know what? I'm not going this this is actually going going back um and not knowing what was going on at the time you know it's un, it's unfortunate for the student athletes to have right. to go through that let me, let me pause and say yeah. listen not trying to make a joke out of it we got to about that. but it's, we talk, we it's years about later it. you got to make we it a little bit like Silas actually went there yep. we we know the extent of what was going on but just mentioning that would like obviously what was going on at Penn State detracted some people from wanting to go there. Yeah. Which is accurate. Um, go later on, later yeah, because okay. you know in the time that I was getting recruited, none, none of that we didn't know about anything Got like it. that. Um, and actually, I remember going to the Penn State campus. Actually, we went Silas. It was myself, Silas, and Eric Joyner. We went to Penn State camp the summer going into our sophomore year of high school. Um, and for me, that camp showed me, hey, I'm, I might I might be okay with this football thing. I remember the love I was getting at this camp. Um, but, you know, I knew I was never going to go to Penn State. Um, great, amazing at football. Great, great school as well. But it just wasn't what I personally thought that I was going to be able to excel the best in do what I needed to do with the connections I wanted to make after after college, you know? So I, I singled it down to Boston College and Stanford. So just one minute detail. For sure. When I think about Penn State, mm-hmm. do they have their names on the back of their jerseys? They don't. I feel like they don't. They don't, yep. And that was another thing. I was like, I can't do it. Because it's a very tradi- one of those traditional yep. schools right. where it's just they have the same jersey every year. Don't yep. matter if Nike come out with 10 jerseys for Florida State or for Ohio State. 
Penn State is just the same white and blue every mm-hmm. year. So that doesn't seem like yeah. something that's very attractive to you. Right? I, I wouldn't have been able to go to, you know, because if I would have went to Penn State, for example, as just saying Penn State as one of the examples of schools, there's other schools like Penn State, but I would be going there purely for football. Right. So, you know, let's say if things don't pan out with football, you have nothing. I wanted to be able to make sure I'm going to school for football and academically. If it's not pan out with football, hey, what's my why? Right. I came here for school. Tough it out for these four years, get your degree, and figure out what you want to do after that. You know what I mean? So um, it was my recruiting process, that was always what I was pretty much trying to figure out, going to these different camps and, and seeing what was good from there. Um, but schools would try to come in, you know, Cy was getting recruited heavy, Eric was getting recruited. Um, so, you know, they always just talking to me, oh, he's already committed. It's like, man, we got to get him off. We got to decommit, you know what I mean? Right. Um, but, you know, I, I stayed with Boston College and, and ended up being the, the best decision for me, and I was very happy with that decision. Well, we definitely respect that. But, I mean, who was offering you the, the bread or the money to try to decommit <laughs> from the school? Because that's what we really – For sure. That's the whole – this whole gotta, gotta interview. We got to take a sip. We got to take a right, sip before we get take a sip. Who was trying to give you like, – uh, let me rephrase that. You know, obviously a lot of people, when you think when you think about Division One, I'd say mostly it's football and basketball. Um, you hear about these illicit, mm-hmm. you know, uh, benefits that may be offered, whether it's money or yeah. trips, plane tickets, whatever it is. Excuse me. Was that something that you had experience with in your time, you know, with these schools? And again, you don't have to name mm-hmm. if that was something you experienced. You know, you don't have to name the schools and coaches or anything like that, but would you say that was something that happened to play a part in your, uh, you know, recruitment? Um, For me personally, it, it didn't play too much into pretty much anything, you know? Okay. If there was things being so offered. too much. Yeah, if there, was, a little bit. if there was things being offered, um, you know, I pretty much didn't want to hear about it. I didn't want to be a part because that's just not what I was about. However, you know, when you go through this recruiting process, you go to these camps, yep. you get to meet a lot of dudes. You Sometimes you see the same faces over and over again. So, you know, um, it, things were definitely going on for sure. You know, the guys that, you know, are towing a line between this school and that school, you know, you'll see an extra visit. You know, you might you might get a, a – you, you go on these unofficial visits mm-hmm. where everything's supposed to be out of pocket for you. Right. right. But, you know, they, they might – Hey, you don't have to pay for this dinner so type of thing, you know. We saw. You know, I don't. You know, I mean, I don't. I don't. I don't ask any <laughs> questions. <laughs> but I've, I personally never been flown out to anywhere. I never received. Me neither. I never received anything. You know, um, I've always been heavy on like my grind, my hustle. Right. But you know, I would be lying to say if these things sometimes didn't happen. Okay. Um, is it as crazy as people might think it is? No, I don't believe so at all. But you do have these special situations right. with these sometimes thought of at the time as special players where, right. you know, they're going to try to give you some sort of incentives mm-hmm. to come to their school. You know, we're all competitors. We're all athletes. We're all about getting this that extra edge that we right. need. So, you know, there's certain times where dudes might try to do a little something just to get right. this player, you know. You got to realize everybody's trying to fight for a job. Yep. You got these recruiters. You got everybody trying to protect their family, get a next job. So, you know, if if they thinking paying for this dinner is going to get this kid here, that's going to mm-hmm. show, him, show him a little bit more love yeah. on an unofficial than it would at another place, let's go ahead and do that. You know what I mean? Sure. But I would say, you know, the, the so big thing. So you is what you're saying. Couple, couple dinners, dinners on a here. private jet. I don't. And I, mean, I was it, a youth. Like, we just say was, it was Burger King. It wasn't even nothing crazy. Yeah, I, you know, we definitely, you know, you ate and stuff like that. Okay. I never, at that age, I never put my card down for anything, so I never paid attention to that. You know what I mean, but so, I say my side, we all, we always handled what we needed to handle. <laughs> okay. I, I was, I didn't know, I didn't know what to talk about. You know me. Right? Yeah, facts. So, so, we talked about. Like kind of the chatter that you get at these camps. Mm-hmm. What are the kind of things? Because I feel like that's something that that gets talked about too. And I don't think we really touched on this in any of our episodes yet. But we, when you got these camps, there's chatter about things that you've heard about certain mm-hmm. ex player was offered this, yeah. and, or you could flat out see, or that player will tell you like, yeah, I just got this from so and so. 
What do you think is the most extreme case that you remember hearing of in terms of a school going above and beyond to try and get a player? The most extreme one that I heard about, um, I'm listening. and not saying any names, was there's a program that literally, you know, moved part of someone's family mm-hmm. to an area to make sure they were straight so that the, the person could go to that school. Wow. And you, you got to... Zion? Nah, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> Yo. But you know, and it's and it's unfortunate with situations like that because you're truly, you're truly taking advantage of the student athlete at that point. Because yes, right. a lot, a lot of, I wouldn't say I'm not going to categorize say most, but a lot of student athletes, they don't have right. the money to foot the bill. Their families in certain situations. Right. So how are you going to tell someone that wants to stay close to home so they can make sure Mom Dukes is doing okay? Because right. they can't. They didn't even know where their meal, their next meal was going. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They had to make sure they got to be able to get back home. How can you tell a dude, hey, come to this next state? You got to help him. You got to give him that incentive to go out there sometimes. So, like I said, these examples like that was truly rare. Right. And, like, them dudes are just special people. Um, but, you know, it's you got to think about things like that. Like, I'll, I'll never forget there was a... Not too many people. No, I told a couple people, but there was one time I, I hid on a train. Now, I'm just at Boston College. Right. I hid on a train just to be able to make it back home for winter break. Oh, you know what I mean? Shit. I remember I remember having to plan it out. I'm going from bathroom well, to bathroom. You were just, like, hurting like that? Like you, you no guap. Have the money? No guap. You know guap. what's funny? The, our last episode was with Ray Rice. He said basically a very similar experience. So he said he had, like, a, a little hoop at the time, a little car. But he said, I don't know how I'm going to put gas in my car to get right. to from Rutgers, New Jersey, to New Rochelle, New York, where we are right now. Yeah. And then back home. Said, that's real life, thing. bro. And that's what that's, that's what real you life, knew, like, dog. I got I to gotta go to the league. Man, bro, that's what I literally, when I, when I did that and I made it through the situation, it wasn't smooth. Right. I'll never forget. <laughs> hey, hey, fam. Like, I uh, everything I love. Because it was the Metro North. Yo, Metro North? nah, yeah, I, nah. It was. It wasn't the Metro North. Nah. The Metro North. I told yeah. you how you do that. It wasn't. It wasn't the Metro North. I got on the uh, the Amtrak. <laughs> okay. I, and I was smart with. It. I said, I'm gonna get on the cellar. It's gonna bring me to New Haven. I said, I got. Mm. I got enough money, and my on me to go from New Haven to Norwalk. I just need to make it to New Haven. And I'm going from bathroom. I put my bag on one place. I'm going from bathroom to bathroom. bathroom. I, okay, I'm straight. I'm straight. I'm straight. Next thing, I guess they must have caught on. Because right. I remember a dude trying to open the door. I'm like, yo, I'm in here. Oh, and I'm, I'm using the bathroom. Right. I wasn't, Shit, obviously. Right. By the time I got out, New Haven stopped. He goes, where's your, where's your ticket? I'm like, it's by my bag. Right. So I walk to my bag. Obviously, he's following me. Right. And make a long story short, by the time I get to my bag, I just turn to him. I'm like, hey, bro. I don't got it. I don't have it. I see. And he's like, dude, you talk to this dude. And so there was a dude waiting. Right. And the dude looked out. He's he told me, he looked in your eyes, he was like, Man, you gotta be careful, bro, because right. they could have had a cop's hair waiting for you, bro. And I'm just trying bro, to get home. I've I I'm just took, trying to get home. I took the metronome for three years going to work and back. Yeah. And it was a hand, only a handful of times where like the train would be stopped at a station and I'm like, why are we stopped here? Why are we stopped here? Mm-hmm. Couple minutes go about five ten minutes. One of the doors open and police come on and somebody didn't pay their ticket, yep. which was eight dollars, ten dollars or something like that. Yeah. It's unfortunate it gets to that, and you know when we talk about especially student athletes, you think about people that you see on TV playing at, you know, places like USC or Penn mm-hmm. State or Boston College, <laughs> that they're worried about you know the ten dollars to get them from you know point A to point B. Um, so one of the things that we like to discuss and talk about is, you know, just student athletes, NCAA players, you know, whether they should be paid or not. Hell yeah. Cause you know, they got many different, wanna... like different, yeah. you know, podcasts that are out there or different, you know, HBO things that are, that are out there to talk about that topic. And I would say it's pretty unanimous that it's the right thing to do. Right. Mm-hmm. And you say, hell yeah, off the bat. So I would ask, you know, if it was up to you, if you would commission an NCAA, if it was up to you to play, pay these student athletes, how would you do it? You know, what would you think would be a way that you, you know, would deem as fair? You know, I don't, I don't know the amount. Um, it would have to be something reasonable. I mean, you can't. I don't think student athletes should be coming up mm-hmm. 
uh, getting paid by the schools, you know. I want to come up. But you, you at least have to, you know, you at least I'm have Zion to get the bare Wilson. minimum. I want two mil. <laughs> Cash. Which would be love, you know what I mean? Cash. Which would be love, but, I mean, you got to at least be able to, I'll never forget, there was a, I forgot who it was, but we could definitely search that. There was a, a situation, I forgot, at one school where I think the dude's mom or grandmother had died mm -hmm. and the coach had bought his ticket home to mm -hmm. go to his funeral. Something that drastic, that's an emergency. Right. And the kid can't, don't have enough money to make it home and the coach gets in trouble for that. You know, I mean, we at least has to be a, some sort of system where there was just you can case, make it home. There was just a case a couple of weeks ago with a, with, a, with a girl who plays basketball who accidentally got a check from Team USA Basketball mm. for participating in a camp over the summer for like $800. And NCAA tried to deem her ineligible. That's for the crazy, season. man. That's crazy. And like accidentally, you, she accidentally got a check for $800. And they were trying to take her career. Yeah. She eventually got reinstated, but like it's stuff like that. This, like we talked to Sai, like you, there's figures out there where you know exactly how much money these players are making a program. You know that these are this is what keeps the athletic program running. The the money that's being generated by all these players, they're they're selling out those tickets. You walk around on campus, you got people wearing your jerseys that they pay for, and you don't see anything from it. Mm -hmm. That's that's got to change. There's no way that there's no way that that can stay the same. It, it, it has to, there there has to be some and it's it's and it's not always money it has to be some sort of compensation or something they can redeem or something because these these schools sometimes they they aren't in the student athlete's shoes so they don't know what they have to deal with you right. know cuz for example like Boston College during break like winter break unless you may be an international student mm -hmm. you have to go home you can't stay on campus some people come from situations where home is not the best option. Right, they right. go back home. They might not come back next right. semester. Right. right. Now, I mean, you got to die. That was me in my school, and we didn't even have dorms. Yeah. Like, we had a dude that played uh, on my team, and he was from Florida. He okay. came up just I – was, I went to a Division three school, played basketball. But he came up, and it was like when he went back home for winter break, my coach was texting me, like, do you know if he's coming back? Because mm -hmm. it, it it's nothing really holding him to come mm -hmm. back. It's, he's not Facts. coming back for a scholarship. He's not coming back to try to make it to the league or anything like yeah. that. So we had, you know, obviously we had a, a similar kind of experience, even though it's a different uh, situation. Um, but when we're talking about that, you know, you had your coach. I, I don't know who your coach is mm -hmm. or whatever, but he's a Division One football coach, yeah. probably making a million dollars. Maybe three million dollars. He's comfortable year. for Whatever. sure. He's, he's definitely comfortable, right? Yeah. So when we ask this question of like, I feel like Div Division One, or we feel like uh, NCAA athletes should be paid. If there was a way that you might break it up, we just looking for some type of creativity, not the right answer at all. Okay. Because we feel like if we ask for sure, people, for sure, a hundred people gonna have a different answer, right? Mm -hmm. So we just throw out all the scenarios so we know these are things that we've kind of touched on already. Generally speaking, we know is Division One men's basketball and football. Those are usually the teams that are profitable, mm -hmm. right? But then you talk about there's UConn women's basketball, there's Tennessee women's basketball, there's Notre Dame's women's basketball. So those are you know some other anomalies that are in there, right? Generally speaking, if we were to break it this down in some way, mm -hmm. that you would just say, it might not be right, but it's kind of fair. Could you think of a way that would say, like, all right, this is cool? Again, considering there's Division One, there's Division Two, there's Division Three. Do you pay kind of everybody evenly, or do you just pay, you know, the star players for each of these? Relative to what they're bringing in. Relative, relative to what they're bringing in. We're talking about Ohio State. We, Ohio State football, we're talking about Kentucky basketball, Duke basketball. Do you have an idea of how you might do that that might make sense? I think it, it should start, and this is just off the top of my head, I think a great place to start is cost of living in the area. Because that's a, that's a great way to, you know, that's where there's difference, mm -hmm. but you can you can bring that up. Man, yeah, this person is getting paid $100 more. Right. But the tickets are hundred dollars more out here, right. you know, or rent is a hundred dollars more out here. So it's going to even it out. Right. So I think you definitely have to start with cost of living when it comes to the different programs bringing in more money. Mm -hmm. 
just because you play on a football team doesn't mean that you should get more money than the women's basketball team, right. you know? It should be, we're all student athletes mm -hmm. in this together, so it should truly be about all of us being together and all of us helping out each other. Just because I play football doesn't mean that I don't have the same situations as the next man right. or woman playing another sport, yep. you know? Yeah. So it would have to definitely be a way where it starts with the area that, you know, the cost of living, and in that area, everyone's getting paid or somehow getting compensated uh, an even amount. When you're playing football, that's that's great. Now you can help out everybody else because you're bringing in more money. You it's going to help more out. money in the tennis team or yeah. the squash right. team or whatever. Right? Yeah. Right. This school had a great sport. But then them, <laughs> them, if we, if we want to be real, we talk about other sports. What other sport on campus has more uh, more student athletes than football? Right. Yeah, you're bringing in more, but it's going to even out. So you know I mean? exactly. So that's that's exactly why we ask the question in the way we do, right? So you would say it would be fine, you know, talking about the, I guess the cost of living, yeah. you know, living in New York. If you played at St. John's or if you played at whatever other New York yeah. school, it's gonna be much different than if you playing at Iowa State where you living in, you know, middle of a cornfield or something like that, right? <laughs> I'm just giving the examples that are out there, right? Mm -hmm. um, because. I would love to see the day where student athletes can capitalize and, you know, make money, even if it's just to live, not to pad their pockets off of their athletic abilities and what they're able to do for the, you know, universities and colleges that yeah. they're at. But I feel like there's, even if today that happened, there's always going to be a, a person or thing that says like, but this isn't right. You know what I mean? You think about yourself if you mm -hmm. were to start play at a university and you're getting the same amount as the person that's the last off the bench or that's never even played in a game. You might not be a person that has a problem with that, but obviously there's going to be people that say, like, I deserve more than... You can't make everybody that. happy. Right. right. You... So you think, it, like, if you if we just threw a number out, all of you people on the, on the uh, football team at Boston College... And I'm just throwing a random number yep, out yep, yep. that will cover your rent that you were living in a little off-campus, you know, apartment for the whole year. If y'all got fifteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars, right? You would say that's something that's fair. You know, just throwing out a random I'm just number. Throwing yeah. a, I don't know the for economics. Sure. I, in Boston. I believe if I said that covered yep. your apartment. If, if we say this is based off cost of living, area, mm -hmm. um, you know, travel, whatever. Right. And this is the a number that's comfortable, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that's right. You know what I mean? Because you you truly can't please everybody. When you start paying based off just Ohio State versus Boston College, just off that, mm -hmm. you're really messing up the dynamic right there. Right. Because now you you recruiting like, oh, I'm gonna be able to get more money. It's gonna become about money for the student athlete. Because it's already about money for the school. Yep. And if anybody said anything different, that's a lie. It's already about money. But once you be, make it about money for the student athlete, their focus is gone now. Now they're no longer going to be a student athlete. They're going to be an athlete first and not a student. And that's, that's the way that I feel okay. about it, right? I feel like student athletes should be paid based, I would say based on the university that they're at, not necessarily based on the production that they give to that university. Okay. Especially because I feel... Generally speaking, across your four-year career, we're not going to talk about the one-year, you know, mm -hmm. one-and-done kind of mm -hmm. people. We're talking about, talking about across the four-year career. There's going to be some type of average of production you're given. I don't think you should be going up and up getting a raise, per se, every year. Um, and I also think... I think incentives are okay. I we, think it's okay to have incentives. We could put it like, I was just, as you were talking... Because, I think coaches, because coaches get incentives. Facts, I feel like a coach, if a coach wins a conference championship, that's an extra 225000 That's if correct. If a coach wins a national championship, that could be an extra million. That's, million. that's correct. But I think the difference between a coach's incentive and a player's incentive, player's incentive is much different. Right. When you talk about a coach's incentive to win a conference championship or a national championship, I don't think that necessarily dictates a lot about the team where I'm going to play this player more, or I'm going to play this player less. I think the coach is always trying to do what's best for the team, whether it's win the conference championship or win the national mm -hmm. championship, or Final Four, whatever mm -hmm. the case is. When you're talking about an individual player, especially an 18-year-old mm -hmm. or a 19-year-old in college, when you talk about somebody, if you average eight points, you're going to get this much money. 
and if you average 12 points, you're going to get this much money. You're going to have a different player just based well, on yeah. the dyma- dynamics of that. Well, yeah. I mean, there, there would have to be a way to do it correctly, but I do think that there is a way to do it where everyone is is rewarded based off of incentives. I th- there's got to be a way that, 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 Academics. that works. Yeah, whether it Academics. could be an academic incentive. Yeah. It could be a... I wouldn't if, get any money off that academic But then, but if you <laughs> but if you think about it, though, because, like, if you true... Let's say you in it for the, for the money or whatnot. If you're thinking, man, if I just don't party as much, mm-hmm. I study, I actually go talk to this TA, yep. I actually show up for class that I'm tired for because I'm already tired for practice. Right. Now it's an extra, like, okay, even though I'm mad tired right now, I just finished practice, I'm about to go out to yep. go to this class. Man, if I put this work in, I'm going to be straight. I can, right. I can help my dukes out right now. Yep. If I just get this 2-5, if I just get this 3-0, you know what I mean? But when it when it's a if you try to make it about production, you got jealousy, it's gonna diminish what whatever that coach is trying to build, mm-hmm. it's gonna make everybody everything about the individuals. Now basketball, you got five individuals right now rather than a team. Right. Football, you got eleven individuals without a without a team, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Some positions are made to shine more than others. Right. A runner, if you are okay running back, an okay wide receiver, that okay running back gonna touch that ball more mm-hmm. than that okay wide receiver. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So if you try to make it about production, next thing you know, oh the quarterback not throwing me the ball. That's what's heck, what's going on. You you just you add in a lot of variables to the situation. When you make it about school, everybody's giving the same plate. Right. Now how you prepare getting to that point, that's all on you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So once again, we all just yeah. throwing out examples. Yeah. But none of this is in stone. It's not like somebody with the watches to be like, "Oh, we got it right, right. there. That's right. what we doing." We, that's what we, hope. <laughs> we hope. We hope. by the time we got thirty episodes, we got somebody from the NCAA be like, "Y'all watch all thirty of these." Yeah. Bam. Y'all all getting paid. Right. Yeah. You know what? D three. We going back to two thousand seven. <laughs> We giving you twenty thousand. Yeah. I hope they send me twenty thousand or something. Put but me in a basketball game or something. Honestly, NCAA, man, basketball two K seven. In my in my opinion, be great. In my opinion, it has to be about education because right. it's going to help even those preparing for college. I, I yeah, we talk about it more now. It's not like it wasn't twenty years ago when dudes was really just pushed through a program. You know, you make things about education now from the middle school to the high school level. Think People are thinking about, you know, school more. Mm-hmm. And because you have to realize that a lot of people are just not going to make it. Right. That's right. So if you have this foundation now that even though you did it for money, regardless, that ain't going to excuse all the skills that you picked up studying right. for all this. You know what I mean? So you're going to be able to use this. A lot of guys are coming to different programs, have it be, a, once again, going to Ohio State, Boston right. College or not thinking that I'm going to make it when you're there's a good chance that you're not, bro. And you fooled around in school, you don't have that. It's life it just gets that much harder. Obviously, we all make success in different ways, but you know, it just it gets that much harder. Not as many doors, you know, like people that you was in classrooms with. Next thing you know, you show up for an interview, that person that was sitting in the other seat was like, "Man, he was in my class." Right. But he remember you not showing up or he don't even remember you. Right. I mean, so we make it about school. It's now we're truly giving the student athletes more. You know what I mean? So, in my opinion, and I, it must be ingrained in me because of my pops, because he was all about school. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying this like I didn't make my mistakes, because right. when I first got to college, phew, crazy. It got it got crazy, bro. When it came, came to academics, I wouldn't say it was when I first got to college. I would say it was the whole five and a half years <laughs> of college. Listen, it was. It was literally like yeah. this is the start, this is the end. Yeah. It was mistakes through the whole, yeah. through the whole shit, honestly, truthfully. But I got to the end though. Facts. I remember I went to go pick up my degree. I called my coach. He was like, "What happened? <laughs> this, <laughs> this is how you look at the phone. You think something happened?" Right. I'm like, "Nah, I just came to pick up my degree, my diploma. I went to come see you." He was like. Wow, I never thought I'd see this day. Wow, bro. <laughs> I never thought I'd see this day. I had a class, Yo, though. this swear to God, he said, I never thought I'd see this day. I walked up to him because he, he, there's actually a high school, like a specialized high school right across the street from my college. Okay. Yeah. So I walked right across the street. 
ask some random person walking by to take a picture of me and my basketball coach with my diploma. That's me dope. Both of us wearing regular clothes. There. Yeah. Never thought I'd see the day. He never thought I'd see the day. Bro, it'd be, like that, bro. it'd be like that, bro. It'd be like that. That's uh, that's one of the things I think about you that I wanted to highlight that we've uncovered here is that from day one, it's always been about more than just your production on a football field. Mm-hmm. Like you said a big part of you going to BC was the life that it could provide you with if, God forbid, football was taken away from you, whether mm-hmm. it be the injury, whether it be to what the situation with the coach, whatever the case may be. How supportive were your coaches of that? Because obviously this ties into like what what ultimately mm. drives the business yep. is yep. you do have programs where there are coaches that don't give a shit about what the person that you want to become. Yep. They just care about what you're going to do on the field, what you're going to do on the court. What type of experience did, did you have while you were in school with, with your coaches, with your advisors, with alumni, boosters that Professors. move like... Like hey, like th- like this guy's really into it. Like he like he's trying to make himself a better yeah. man, not just a better football yep. player. I would say um, the people that really are truly behind you day one is you know we call it uh, LRSA at Boston College, Learning Resources for Student Athletes. Um, my advisor, her name was Lee Metzger. Metzger, shout out to Lee because I definitely gave her a bunch of gray hairs on the real. Um, but she was behind me since day one, you know. These are the people that work with you. They they see your true potential mm-hmm. as a human being. Yep. Um, coaches, you never know what you're going to get. Right. Did I have my coaches that truly didn't care about school? They just want to make sure you did the minimum to make sure you're able to play? Because most, I'm straight up, most coaches, they just want to make sure you're able to play. Bro, that was my coach. After that, they, they grown men. Go. Yeah, they grown men. They got to worry about their life too sometimes. Two point on, go. Yeah. That was the, <laughs> the mantra. Yeah, yeah, but you know, I, I definitely had uh, a few coaches. Um, one, I'm forgetting his name, which he was a very important person in my life, which is crazy. I'm forgetting his name, but you know, they're really behind you because they've been through this before. Right. This is once again going to, you know, coach telling you something, hey, you better at this position. Like, some of these dudes, they've seen this before. They don't want you to right. make the same mistakes that they right. made. You know what I mean? So it, it it truly just depends, you know. Not every place is going to be the same. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's what going through the recruiting process, I guess now I'm taking a step back, that, that you have to realize Hard. what you're going to get from this program. Right. Now, you want to just go straight football, and that's what your heart say, then do that. But realize if you need help in other areas, know that you chose that school, and that school's not giving you that help. You should have known that from day one. Because, I mean, again, this kind of ties into the whole whether athletes deserve to be paid conversation. Mm -hmm. They're investing in you as a student athlete, right? So there can't be an issue if you you decide to exercise your full right as a student. Mm Mm-hmm not just as the athlete. Mm. Because like you said, there are coaches that they don't care. As long as you are eligible, I do not care what you're doing us right. off the field, in the classroom. But I feel like there are programs where it's kind of frowned upon that you're exercising your right to be a student and utilize it definitely is. all of, to your greatest potential, not just enough to get by, not just enough to get on the field, but you building yourself as a man is something that that matters too, you know, like, and, and I think you, you've you carried that through your professional career too with different internships that you've mm-hmm. had. And I think it's, it's, yeah, I heard he was getting his MBA too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Unless he already did that and I'm late. No, I'm not done with that. Oh, yeah, right, I'm taking right, it. Second. Yeah. Finish your question. Yeah. I got um, this. But no, I, th- I think that's something that, that if, if these, if players aren't getting paid, they deserve the right to exercise their full <clears throat> ability to be student athletes. Yes, bro. And, yes. utilize, and and say, like, hey, listen, like, this isn't my job. Like, I'm here. Like, you want me to be a student, too. I'm, I'm trying to make sure I get my degree and I'm trying to make sure I get this internship. I'm trying to make sure I establish these relationships. Mm-hmm. Did you feel like there was ever a time where, whether it be other players, coaches, administration, that kind of, I feel like we, we've heard about this with teachers that would let stuff slide, that, like, never really held you accountable? They're, they're definitely... Um... It, it goes two ways. Because right. you, as a student athlete in school, you'll have those teachers that hate you because you're an athlete. Yep. As soon as you walk in there with your, with your hoodie on, or even if you don't, my fault, you don't, you don't, you're not walking in class with your hoodie on. Right. If you're doing that, don't do that. But, like, you know, they'll, they'll see, oh, 
Boston College football. Right. They're like, Psh, he don't want to be here, so you know? And then you're going to have those those teachers that, oh, man, I'm going to have to help him out a little right. bit, you know? Um, so you're going to get... I mean, shit. Then you Both. also got the teachers that are fans. Yes. Yeah. So you got, like, some tickets for this. Yeah. Game? So, and I've I've met I've met all those types of teachers, yeah. you know. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're doing what you need to do, or at least you put in the effort, yep. none of these teachers are gonna be a problem. Right. Well, none of them. Were you like a name on campus? Because like, mm-hmm. and I don't know how to ask that because you obviously you made it to the next level. Yeah. So probably at some point people were like. <laughs> This is the football guy that's that's out there. I never had that problem. For People sure. just thought I played basketball because I was six six. When I was in the Bronx. You know what I'm saying? But you specifically, people see you on TV. Mm-hmm. You know, you might be just the guy you projected to go in the yeah. draft at this and that. Was it you going into class like every teacher or professor knew who you were, or did you not necessarily have that? Not, not really. I tried to separate myself as much as I could from the athlete part of being a student athlete because that's going to follow me wherever I go. You know what I mean? You you a black kid going to Boston College, you're going to assume two things. It's not always right, but you're going to assume low-income family mm. here on scholarship plays a sport. Oh, it's like that? I, didn't, I don't know. It's just it depending, the, like depending so on the school that you go to. Okay. Yeah, because... Okay. And, and, it's, and some, sometimes that's people... Yeah, sometimes people take offense to that, but it's like just just tone it back a little bit because the reality is that's what it, it is a lot. What it is. So don't don't get so offended. Just use that to your example. You here exactly. now. That's all you need to focus about. Exactly. Forget that other stuff. What people might assume about you. Now the door's open. You have the opportunity to write your own book. Right. So what you gonna do? Right. And know I mean, what I mean? And, and that's honorable. So let's talk about how you've kind of carried that over into your professional career. Like, yeah. We talked about a little bit off air, like I asked about, you know, what you have planned for the off season and, mm-hmm. and you highlighted the fact that in previous off seasons you've done internships, you've started your, your pursuit yeah. of your MBA. Do you think that's stuff that like again you, you you dedicate this back to your father, but is that something that's just been ingrained in you and now you just say like, Hey, this is how I have to spend my idle time, if you will? Yeah. Making myself a better person? Um for me personally, I always wanted to be different. Right. So, you know, when I got to Boston College, I tried to get involved with the school. Right. So, you know, I was I was blessed enough to be an orientation leader yep. one year. Um, so I led groups of freshmen come into Boston College and pretty much telling them about college and what right. to expect. You know, that was something that I love to do because I saw Boston, Boston College on both sides. Yep. So where the side, what happens when you don't make the best decisions, mm-hmm when you're not doing as well in school and mm-hmm. partying and stuff like that, mm-hmm. as well as I saw Boston College side when I was doing well in school, when I was making the right decisions. Um, 48 hours retreats, you know, doing that. And going to the NFL, I just carried with that. I just always knew that this football stuff is not right. going to last forever. Right. Um, and the crazy thing is, is like I never even wanted to play football past college. Really? I was going to go to the Marines. Wow. Straight up. like. Wow. Straight up from that's what I, I I had a simplify on my locker since the first day I got to college. Wow! Because that was a plan. The plan was play football in college, go to the Marines, um, be a recon Marine, and then see what I'm gonna do after that. Wow! Yeah, and literally that was my plan all this senior year. Mm-hmm. I'll never forget. We have a a, a game going. Um, the reporters come in to like interview us yep. or whatnot, and you know I'm doing well. Mm-hmm. That's a blessing. So they interviewed me, one of the uh, the highlight guys, and they're you know they're telling me, seeing oh how does it feel knowing you're gonna be playing on Sundays, whoop de whoop. Right. And I told dude in his face, I'm like I have no idea what that feeling is like, cause that's not what I'm doing. That's crazy. So I explained to them the whole thing. A lot of people in the school already knew that's why I was playing. Cause I've been saying that since day one. Right. Next thing you know, the game's going on. I'm hooping. I'm making a couple mm-hmm. plays. And they broadcast it out in the air. I used to tell my pops this. Like, I want to go to the Marines. I want right. to go to the Army. Right. He always thought I was playing. He used right. to always tell me no. Right. But that was the situation when it became real to everybody. That, That's yo, right. this dude is for real about this. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll never forget after the game was over, I'm getting, I have a bunch of text messages from family members. Right. Talking about my pops and mm-hmm. all this and that. And my pops finally reached out to me uh, a day or two later and shared his thoughts on it you know 
he, how he didn't want me to go for his reasons. Mm -hmm. And so I was just like, all right, well, no bull. I was like, I guess I'll just do this football stuff. Right. And fortunately, I worked hard, and it was a great plan B. And so Crazy. life has changed with yeah. that. But, you know, I just, me personally, I've always just been different. I've never yeah. been about football. Right. Everything was just personal. Yeah. I just made it personal. It was about just working hard. You know what I mean? Showing love, getting to meet great people, right. everybody, yep. doing that. So what excites you off the football field now? Opportunities. You know, I get to, because of football, I get to meet so many people. I get to do so many things, right. you know what I mean? Um, like, yeah, people can look at someone in my position and think, oh, he's just an athlete. Right. But that time you get to prove to them that you were something more. Right. What excites me about that is I get to share that with somebody else. I'm like, yeah, I'm good, but my boy is also right. same like me. Let me introduce you to him. Right. Can you now, put me on like that? For sure. <laughs> like, just tell yo, tell your coach. I'm nice too. Like I never really played football. I go be a tight end. Hey, bro, it's, it's, I can, I can, Shotty, I can, hey, Shotty could tell you it's different out there. It's nah, different I know it's out different, there. But I can catch. I don't know how well I can get hit and Bam, keep the bro. ball. I probably can't do that. Like, but like, <laughs> throw me the rock, bro. Sling the pin. Bro, we 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 talk we talk about this during practice all the time. Because when you start in in the NFL, you got spring ball, yep. spring practices, OTAs. It's, sh it's shorts and jerseys. That's pretty much it. Mm. Dudes be dudes be out there, one-handed catches, yeah, doing all the crazy right. things. Right. But when them pads get put on, them eye, everything changes, man. You ain't, you ain't running across that center that that smooth. You ain't trying to go and snag that that crazy, man. So I mean, I'm not gonna knock you, but <laughs> just know is, that it's different. The thing is, if it's somebody it's that's different, like, bro. A B size, like Antonio Brown size. You'll be I can get by I can get hit by him. I You'll can't be surprised. really get hit by like a whole like defensive player like like two eighty guy. I'm not with that at all. Bro. But it, you'll be surprised. Sometimes it'd be the littlest dudes out right. there. <laughs> Smacking. Smacking, bro. My knees are not that strong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? so, yeah, so I'm glad I never really like ventured into this. Like thing. Earl, Earl Thomas, if you ever meet him in person, little dude, what do you think about? Okay, come across that center. You gonna find out a lot about yourself. Right. I always imagine if I was playing football, I'd be out there wild and like somebody come yeah. and try to tackle me. Cam, bro, to the face, bro. <laughs> Cam, <laughs> Cam Chancellor like, hit. Call, call the tech, bro. Call the tech. <laughs> call the tech. He said, "Call the tech." tech. He said, "Of course." He didn't tell dude get hit. You ain't gonna throw this flag. Right. Yeah, right. Like, right. You ain't gonna throw this flag. He hit me in my shoulder. Right. That's a foul. But. You know what I mean? He's reaching, fam. That's, that's me. <laughs> Facts, <laughs> though. It's me. different, bro. Bro, I, I, I remember Cam uh, Chancellor hit Megatron one time. Nope. And this is no over-exaggeration. Oh, I'm the biggest fuck. It, like sounded, it sounded like a gun went off in the stadium. What? Bro. Psh. Gilbert. Man, I never... Quick, 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 quick little story about yeah. Cam. I love sharing this shit. Yeah. So one off season, you know, I'm I'm chilling, camp great dude, the yep. enforcer, leader of that of that squad. Um, it's unfortunate he's not playing anymore. Once again, yep. you never know when the shit gonna end. But next year, I remember I'm talking in the off season. I'm like, bro, I want to be able to hit like you one day. Right. So he's showing me his different techniques. You know, he's telling you how, you know, when when you when you hit somebody, you throw your shoulder into like you throwing a punch. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. And so he does the day. I have a pad right here. Mm -hmm. Once again, me and him, two grown men. Right. I have a pad right here. He does the six-inch punch and goes, you know, you throw that shot, bam, just like that. My face is just like, okay, for sure. I got you. I got you. Right. Right. I've never felt so much pain and energy. <laughs> <laughs> Get boom from right there. Right. Bro, I'll never forget that shit to this so day. So I was your, like, NFL moment. It was the can chancellor hit. It wasn't, it wasn't my... Like, I, I had an NFL oh, what moment. What was the one? What was the one where you said like, "I right, this isn't college or this isn't like boys. This is grown men." I was I was on special teams my rookie year for Seattle. This was 
Yeah, we were playing the Denver Broncos, and one of their starting linebackers, I think, was on special teams. And I'm trying to block Bull, mm -hmm. and he just he goes like this, trying to like go down the field. The play's about to pretty much be over. Right. And the fact that I couldn't like move his right. his arm. <laughs> I'm over like, come on, fam. I'm here. I'm here. Just, uh, okay. I'm like, <laughs> you feel that strength? Like, it's, it's, it's different, bro. When you a kid, that's why, like, cute dudes can't do one-on-one, one-and-done in football. Right, right. When you a kid and then you face a true grown man, it's different, bro. I said, this motherfucker got wife and kids. <laughs> I, I'm not exaggerating, dog. I, in the middle, I'm like, he got some other shit going on. <laughs> and that, and that rookie, I said, okay, I, I know, I know where I need to be at now. You know what I mean? Because now, now that I come across dudes and they do like, man, like what you doing out there? You hitting like that? I'm like. You just, you just, shit becomes normal, dog, because right. you meet some people where it's like, you think you somewhere, and then you meet that dude that's there or more. Okay, I got to get right. So, how do you think that kind of, because that's another thing that, like, we talked about opportunity and chance. You were blessed enough to be drafted by a team that, that had, like, like, world-class <sighs> leaders. Man. Talk about, you, Legion of Boom, like. Yep. Professionals, like a world class organization with with guys that you know don't don't mess around. Like yep. outside of Cam, and I mean I'm going to assume Richard Sherman is a part of that that piece of the puzzle too. Hell yeah! How important was that for you in terms of understanding the landscape of the NFL as a rookie coming into the league and saying like, oh, like these are guys that like that know what they're talking about. It it was it was a blessing, bro, because it was a it was a blessing. And a curse at the same time when the way I came into the league because it was never a focus of mine thing. Right. I'm just I'm just doing football. Right. Mm -hmm. But when you get around true professionals, there's a difference between being a great athlete and yeah. being a professional. I was around true professionals and to see how they how they went about the game, mm -hmm. how Earl worked, how Sherm worked, mm -hmm. how all these dudes worked, you had to buy in. Right. So it was a it was a learning curve. Right. I'm like I can't just come out here and just run around. Right. I got to learn my role. I got to learn my, I got to do everything to be around so I can be next to these, these elite athletes right here. You know what I mean? So it, it helped me as I, you know, I got traded to Kansas city and I'm with the jets now. I now I can see differences of why certain things might not work out or where, where the group needs to be right. to excel at a certain level. You know what I mean, cause my rookie, we went to the, to the Super Bowl. So I saw the work that needed to be put in to go to the Super Bowl. You know what I mean? So it was a blessing to learn that. Now I'm at the point going into year six where younger dudes are asking me, they see how I work, some of the things I'm producing. Like, man, how do you do that? What do you do with your body? This, right. that, and the third. Now I can share this knowledge because I got it from them. I didn't, I didn't learn it on my own. I just watched them. Cold tub, hot tub every day. Mm -hmm. Going into the, uh, the training room, getting rehab, uh, maintenance work done. Pay attention to how they eat, yep. you know, hearing their conversations. Hey, man, I'm in bed 8 30, 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. I ain't in bed 8 30, 9 o'clock, but that's one of the things I'm not doing. But, you know, it's dudes, they, they find out their body and they learn themselves, man. And I wish sometimes that supporters, I don't call people fans, I call them supporters. I wish that supporters knew some of the work that these dudes put in because they really make it about their lives, bro. Mm -hmm. Really? Man, wait, so wait, I got to, nah. Yeah, do that, that fire question. Fire question. Yeah. So what years exactly were you with the Seahawks? The Seahawks? 2000. Should, should Marshawn wait, Lynch have gotten oh, the ball? No, 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 he's no, going no. with this. That's not where I'm going with this. <laughs> that's where I want to go. That's not where I'm going with this. Hold, hold your question until yeah. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> what years were you with the Seahawks? Yeah, take your swig. So I barely even swig. Um, it was, so it was 2014, 15, and 16. All right. All right, bet. So, so Super Bowl, you playoffs, got, I'm playoffs. I'm not talking about no playoffs, right? For sure. We think back to that, right? Dirty Sprite 2 comes out. It's lit. <laughs> it's the most fire album of all time. We heard about in the locker room, kind of, it's nah. kind of shaky. You can, you can tell me it wasn't a thing. Because oh, if I'm man, trying to get warmed funny. up for the game, mm -hmm. I want to hear Blow a Bag. I want to hear... 
like all of that. I want to. <laughs> Fuck up some comments, bro. You can't really like play that on your on your iPod, am I right? Or what? Or you could tell me y'all was listening to the future in lockdown. Man, first and foremost, I like to say what most of what the media says yep. is false. It's a lot of speculation. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of what they guessed and this and that happened. Right. I'm gonna be straight with you. I've never heard so much future in my damn life in that damn locker room. No bull. Purposely. Purposely. Mm. Purposely, Yeah, because I feel like the narrative was that, like, teams were playing it on the road. I heard that, like, what I was reading. I, I, I heard people like, oh, it's, not, it's not allowed to I be said, played in there. it's not allowed. I'm like, there's no way I'm about to play on a Sunday in 2016, yeah. and I cannot listen to Future. Yeah. Guess what? Bro. Cut me, bro. <laughs> Cut me. You heard? <laughs> like, Dog, you got to realize, it's, it's a bunch of grown, it's a bunch of grown men in the locker room. Right. So. Because I know, I know, listen, you don't got to confirm or deny, I know there's no way Russell Wilson was in there like, mm, this, this shit is fire. For sure. There's no Good, way. Great, great dude, by the way. Great dude. He's the, he's one of the the few people that what you see on TV that's not a that's not fake. I don't think that's so. That's real. I that's also saw that's that. every day. I saw fam. his like the like you know the John Gruden camp shit For they used sure. to do. Yeah, yeah. I saw that before he came into the NFL. Okay. So I just said like a lot of people say like he's like a square because they like they like to like angle him mm-hmm. and future and they like two completely different different pieces. I don't person. I don't angle that. I'm just like. He's like a regular dude, yeah. like, which is, that's fine. Yeah. I, I like to think of myself as a regular dude, you know what I mean? But. So that's kind of like how I view it. So you would say he's like like that, like he's not like what you... He's of. he's just a person, man, that he, he loves, he works. He's one of the true people that's first one in, last one out. Um, and when it, when, with the future thing, you know, it... It wasn't like dudes was really trying to be malicious about it, um, but they just thought it was funny. You right. know what I mean? Shit was funny. You get a you get a chance now. Shorty's in a lock in the locker room area on the field. You know, they thought just the whole situation was funny. So Facts. it wasn't like at the end of the day, that's that's quarterback number one. You want to take care of your guy, right. but just with the homies, as homies go through, so you gonna make a little fun. Yeah, you gonna poke some fun. Of course. You sleep, you got you had a bad night, we got videos of you, of course we're gonna do that. You yeah. know what I mean? So when when I say like, you know, we, they were playing future like crazy, cause one, future was already being played. But then the extra playing of future was mm-hmm. done just to be like, what he gonna do? <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause a, a dude like him that is truly who he is. People want might want to test, okay, he's gonna right. have a breaking point. Right. Can we get him to that nah? Not not with him. Not with him. So this uh the question I want to get out to end it. All right. Super Bowl against the Patriots. Mm, 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 mm. There could be a, a a segment done on just those last couple seconds, not even on the field, by the way. Oh yeah, that's that's where I wanted to get to was well number one, should Marshawn have gotten the ball, in your opinion? Um, in my opinion, should he have gotten the ball? Yes. However, um, I don't think Coach Carroll's at fault. Okay. Why is that? Because if people have to realize how much goes into these games, the game planning, everything that these coaches do, their livelihoods that count on these moments, no one's, people are saying that he purposely did or it's just so. I heard heard things like, (laughs) so Marshawn doesn't. doesn't get the MVP or something. I heard a bunch of things, bro. Right. And it's like, I, in my opinion, yep. that's not what happened. Right. Coach Carroll does a lot of things different. He makes a lot of plays. And people are like, oh, what is he doing getting this for formation, running this play? And a lot of times the shit worked out. Right. That was just a time where it didn't. He's human. He, mm-hmm. you know, he made a call and it didn't work out. Right. Mm-hmm. Do I think Marshawn should have got the ball? Yes. However, I'm not going to knock him on his play calling or whoever made that play, because I'm not sure exactly who made the play, mm-hmm. who made that call. I'm not going to knock him on that because right. if you if people truly get out their feelings about that one play right. and 
look at what this man has done and the calls that he's made. Yeah, I made it to the Super Bowl last play. Like, I had a chance right. to win. Right. You so know, if you want to... Remember, like, remember the field goal? One play, yeah, the field goal yeah. that we threw right. the touchdown yeah. for? Yeah. If that didn't work out... Right, you wouldn't have even been in that position. Dude, no, they would have been like, what is he doing? He ruined the game on that right. one. Right. But it worked out. You know what I mean? He... He's a person. He try. He's a. Hey, he has a game plan. He's always trying to execute. Now, but he's human at the same time. That play made him human. And that's why people wanted to attack him. Once again, in my opinion. How was um, the locker room? Yeah, I want to say like I know right now. This man. is a couple years later, so I feel like you probably steady minded. Yeah. Where you it like, still gives me yeah, chills. You know, it's not, it I'm probably going to the locker room sick. Yeah. I'm Bro, tight. Let me tell you how this shit went down on the sideline. So, Curse just made this crazy catch. Yep. We all going crazy. The whole defense, you know, you, we, we can't go past the 30-yard line yep. on the sideline. So, we huddled up at the end, you know. Now, the ball is on the two yep. or the half two, or whatever. Yep. Um, so, now we thinking, all the way back, we thinking, we, we won. We it's a wrap. Right. Next thing you know, our backup quarterback starts bugging out a little bit. Mm-hmm. And we like, yo, you good? Like, we, yeah. we all getting hyped. The whole yeah. defense going crazy. Yeah. Like, bro, you good? And he's mad about the call. If I, if I, if I, if I remember, knew the was, he, he knew the call because right. he, he's mic'd up. Oh, okay. okay. So, if, if I remember this correctly, about he was mad about the call. He was bugging out, but he's mad about the call. So, dudes, the older dudes talking to him, whoop de whoop And i never forget someone said that uh, our fullback was like, I'm not coming off the field. They had to get him off the field. Wow. So the, all this commotion is going on, and we see we see our backer quarterback spazzing out. So now we just like, what's about to happen? Right. The whole place is going crazy. Our sideline, you can hear a pin drop. Oh, so to be in that, bro, saying talk about this shit right so now. Cool. To be in that moment, dog, like just everybody just don't say anything real quick. So imagine that for about ten seconds. And you watch what happened, Psh, dog. Bro, I'm throwing I never, my in the stands. I always told people, my cleats off. I never want to see out. grown men cry like that again in my life. Right. Nah, it's different. You saw That's motherfuckers different. get their heart just, it was just so heartbreaking, dog. And, I can imagine that. man, that shit was real. Man, that's crazy. I got to take a sip after that. <laughs> I feel you, I feel you. So, I mean, well, one, we we took it from where you first started playing football yep. to, we say, the penultimate. I love that word. It's the only <laughs> time I got that views on my life. The penultimate <laughs> position, you're like, well, you actually at the Super Bowl, right? And, mm-hmm. you know, obviously, we know how it ended up. Um, but we wanted to actually talk about some things that we felt were very important, not only to us, to society, but also to you. Yeah. Um, and we feel like it's been creeping into social media lately as it's been something that, you know, different, we say public figures, whether they're entertainers, sports figures, whatever, have been dealing with, is being mental health, mm-hmm. right? And understand that I don't want to exactly tag you as that, but just the research that we've done, seeing that you're someone that wants to share some of your experiences that you've had, um, in discussing, you know, maybe some things that you've been through to maybe help some people that are out there that don't exactly know what they're going through. Mm -hmm. Um, So we wanted to make sure we touched on that. Definitely. Um, So it's not just, you know, fun and games that's going on. So understand it from what I I read, I believe it was the Seattle Times or the Seattle Post, you Mm -hmm. correct me. it was a time was back in times, but it, 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 don't, it don't matter. Times. It was back right. in Seattle. I believe it was back in 2012 um, that you came to the realization or you came uh, diagnosed with uh, depression, mm-hmm. right? That's something that myself I have experienced with. I think my experience is back in more so 2010, 2011, my fiance being here. She's aware with that experience. My best friend Brian, he's aware with that experience as well. Um, but we know that that happens from a million and one different type of things that mm-hmm. may come up. 
Um, but just, you know, obviously people looking at you, you're the NFL guy, you got all the money, you got all the success mm-hmm. and things of like that. Nobody would think it's you as somebody who may even be going through that. You know, is this something that you may want to share with people out there, you know, just, you know, some of the experiences you have? Yeah, man. I, um, like you said, I think, yeah, back in 2012, that's when I was diagnosed with it. Um, and I, I think it, it truly starts with, you know, obviously males and females deal with this, mm-hmm. but it truly starts with, you know, growing up as a young black man in America, mm-hmm. you know, you, you grow up with, you have to be hard. You have to, nothing, ha- nothing can bother you, you know, and place I grew up everything was mental mm-hmm. you got pushed through everything everything's mental you gotta keep working gotta keep pushing so there's a lot of things that I was dealing with that I had no idea that was truly going on so everything that's kept piling up piling up piling up and next thing you know um, junior year comes around and things just I'm, I'm not able to push through things no more mm. and it started where I uh, I'm doing bad in school football's going down now, you know, everything about my life, my two things, school and football now are crashing. Mm -hmm. My coach brings me in and had one of the moments where it's like, he's pissed at, like he's, I know he's mad at me. He sits down and he just goes, what's going on? It felt like bull just turned the switch and everything just kept pouring out. I thought like, I didn't know. And force, I was old enough at the time to realize, like, man, now nah, you, something needs to happen. Like, you need to go get help. Because in a black community, I'm not just, not just the black community, but in a lot of minority communities, going to get help is frowned upon. Right. That's how, that's the experience that I had. Yeah. That's like the experience it's seen, that I had. Somehow it's seen as a weakness. Yeah. Yes. And be a man and you weak? What? Right. That's crazy. Right. You know what I mean? Um, but at the time I had, I had to be real with myself and it was, it was such a blessing, bro. Um, and, and as you said, you know, me being in my in the position that I am, people, a lot of people will think like, oh, you don't go through certain things. You haven't gone through this. You haven't gone through that. And I'll never forget my thought process started to change. Actually, I want to say a year, two years before that, I went on this retreat called 48 hours. Mm-hmm. At the end of 40 hours, we have this thing called a fishbowl. So it's you, we're in an auditorium. There's about 500 plus freshmen. Mm-hmm. A person puts down a seat. Is this at BC? At Boston that's College. That's okay. A person puts down the seat. One of the teachers um, puts down a seat and he says, anybody can share anything. Wow. Now I'm watching person after person go up and they're starting to share their stories. It's crazy when you put a seat down in front of someone, he has them sitting and said, just share whatever you want. It's crazy how everything comes, starts to come out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm watching these people that on, at face value, I might have judged them. Right. I'm seeing this little girl come up. I'm like, oh, she's fine. Her life was perfect. She right. has That's this. That's not a big deal. Yeah, like, Tori, Tori right. Birch, that. Like, right. on, sure. the, on the surface, she's perfect. Sure. Next, you know, a lot of those people start sharing their stories. I'm like, oh, shit. Like, this person's been through a lot. And I would have had no idea, bro. Mm -hmm. And that's what made me realize, like, man, if we just talk to each other, if we can just find a way to share what's going on in here, we'll we'll realize that we're not alone. Because a lot of times when you go through things, you feel as though you're alone. That's what brings you down that circle. Mm -hmm. That that deep, dark place that sometimes you get so dark, there's no more light. And you can't do anything after that. So now my mind's starting to churn. My mind's starting to churn a little bit. Like, man, I'm not alone. Like, a lot of people out here struggling or going through something more than me, um, which is a dangerous business to get into because it's like when you go through your problems, you're like, well, this person got it worse than me. Right. Stuff, and fine. Struggle is right. still a struggle. Right. right. It, it doesn't matter mm-hmm. at the, the level it is. Struggle is still a struggle. It's right. bothering you every day. Um, but once I got diagnosed and I started to get help, I knew that there was, hearing these people, I knew there was more out there. Yeah. So I'm like, this is perfect. Yeah. If I can be vulnerable, mm-hmm. then the next person can, and the next person can. Now we're going to not lose as many people mm-hmm. that think they're truly alone, alone because mm-hmm. once you start sharing, you're going to realize the person that you're home with, your homie, it's like, man, he was going through that too, but he never told me. Right. Right. You know what I mean? 
And it started with that. And then the last thing I watched was um, a TED Talk by Brene Brown. Mm -hmm. And it's called The Power of Vulnerability. If you haven't seen it, definitely got to check it out, man. That, that, watching that speech alone was life-changing for me. And it forced me to share my story, not so that people can know more about me, is that for those that are scared to learn about themselves and tell people about themselves that they can. Mm -hmm. Because we are not alone, bro. No, no one's alone in this. Like the next man might be going through something similar. And now I get a, I have the platform to show people like there's a light at the end of this tunnel. And this is still a process. This is not like this was just college and it's done with now. Like, you know, I still got to, I got to, you know, take whatever I need to take. I got to talk to this person, That's talk to, to that day? person. To this we, day. We were talking about this is back in 2012 where yep. we kind of realized, or you kind of realized this, you know, situation going on within yourself. To this day, is something that you're still working with? Yeah, for sure. For okay. sure. Yep. And I, I'm not sure if you know, but is it something you think is like a... Does it end to it? Or do you think it's... Because... And I'm just going to say, this is something that I... What I read that was out there, again, to that Seattle... Mm -hmm. I think it was Seattle Times article. It was a chemical thing. That yeah. Within you. That it's... It's not it's really not something that's like around you, you know, maybe family issues that are yeah. coming up. Yeah, it's it's really true. just... It, it happens. That it's like a chemical imbalance or whatever the case is that it's just not right. Yeah. So do you think it's... You know, the reason I'm asking this for the people that may be listening out there that may be experiencing similar situations or just mm -hmm. experiencing situations, um, you know, do you encourage them either one to go talk to their friends or talk to, you know, maybe go seek professional help? You know, something that helped you, do you think it's similar that might help other people? I, I would say don't lose courage, right. you know, because you might. You can't be vulnerable with everybody. Mm -hmm. That's the unfortunate thing. There's some things you might share with another person. That person, that person didn't need that info on you. Right. They're gonna think differently about you. Sure. But don't lose courage. Yeah. Don't lose courage just because that one person or those two people right. can't appreciate mm -hmm. what you were able to share with you. Can't appreciate the trust that they that you had in them right. to be able to share that. You know, um, you just have to. You have to keep pushing, keep going, because you're gonna find those people that you're gonna you're gonna click with. Yeah. Like, I'll never forget there was the first lady that I saw, loved her to death. It couldn't have been more of a perfect situation. Right. She was so young, she had to leave, so I had to go to this other dude. Mm -hmm. Didn't fuck with him. This I is the is this, this is a this psychiatrist, is, psychologist. Yeah, I don't yeah. know the difference. I think I, I think I saw, I think I saw a psychologist in my day. This is again, this is like 2010. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think yeah. I think it was a psychologist. But I, I shared mm -hmm. with Brian, mm -hmm. I think I shared with my fiance, I didn't fuck with him at all. I saw him twice, mm -hmm. and that was it. I mm -hmm. just didn't feel, I, I got to a point where it was a wall. I felt like he was judging me. I felt like yep. things that I was saying, he was looking at me like, really? Like, yep. I, I got to that point. Yeah. And it was only very recently, I think it was maybe a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. that I got into details with, again, both of them. And I'm like, this is kind of what happened, and this is why I stopped, you know, going. Yeah. So you saying you you were seeing, uh, I guess, a young lady. She was too young. And she, it just so happened that just and where I, where I caught her in her process, mm -hmm. she was towards the end of her stint at Boston College. Oh, okay. So, so it wasn't like a, yeah. Got it. So she was just going to get more education and move on to the next place or the next level or whatnot. So I had to go see this dude. I didn't fuck with dude. And and my first thing I thought of, I'm like, man, people really need help. And if they if this is the first person they come to, they're gonna shut that door forever, bro. Right. Which is crazy. And it's like, if you really need that help, you need that. Because, you know, there's gonna be some people you go to where they're thinking the first uh remedy is medicine. Yeah. Medicine's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. right. Sometimes you're gonna need it. Right. But for some people, it's just talking through things. You're going to be all right if you just talk through things. You keep continue to talk through things. Mm -hmm. You build this confidence in yourself. You're able, you know yourself more. You know what makes you tick. You're able to remove yourself from situations if that's the case, right. if you need to do that. But if you, if you can't find these things out for yourself and, and by talking with people, it's, it's just going to be tough. But you just have to keep the faith, keep pushing on. Because um, the, 
roads get dark and and life is crazy, but man, you just you're truly not alone in this because when you feel alone, you feel as the whole world's against you, right. and that's not the case. It's not the case, man. So that's what I try to do with my platform: just tell people, man, you can you can do it, man. If I can do it, you can do it. When I can do it, where I gotta face all these people, where I'm being vulnerable now, I'm walking into a fully masculine locker room with dudes right. that are supposed to act like we all tough and we not. Next thing you know, I got dudes secretly coming to me. Hey, bro, I appreciate you sharing that, man. You know, I actually been, what do you think? You can help me out with this, that, and the third. You know, uh, parents in my DMs talking about, hey, my son really appreciated that. He's in a dark place, this and that. And that's what makes it all worth it, dog, because we're all in this shit together. Every struggle is universal. Mm -hmm. It don't matter if you're the richest mm -hmm. person in the world, you know struggle mm -hmm. in, some, in some way, shape, or form. You know what I mean? So we just have to continue this conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're going to be able to move through certain things now. Now, you know, it gets into policy. You're more comfortable with yourself. You can comfortably talk about politics without getting your feelings hurt. Right. You know what I mean? And it's just, it's going to be able to have all of us join together and it'd be a better place for everybody, dog. You know I, mean? I can certainly appreciate that. That was powerful, bro. Appreciate you. Very much so. And, and we thought that was really kind of the unique part as to, you know, why we asked you to be here with us today, you know, talk about your whole journey um, as a student athlete and also just, you know, some of the things that make you very unique. Um, so we certainly appreciate you sharing that, you know, part with us. We know that's probably not something. It might be something that you like sharing now because mm -hmm. it may help other people, but it's certainly not something that's, you know, the best thing to talk about. Um, so as we wrap things up, you know, we want to thank you for joining us again. Definitely. And I know just before we actually started rolling here, I know you mentioned uh, some things about the Humane Society. Mm. Uh, I'm, not sure to, I'm not sure if that's something that you're, you know, deeply involved with or if there's anything even with, you know, the mental health stuff that we discussed. Anything out there that you want to say you're involved with, you want to push out there, this is your time really that you can talk about anything you got going on. Um, you know, there's nothing that I'm directly involved with to where, like, you know, I'm really pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. Right now, i just been more like, you know, providing services, uh, getting the word out for whoever needs a uh, little bit of help. But, you know, when I was in Washington, mm -hmm. I was definitely behind a lot, like the Seattle Humane Society. I did a lot of work with them. We used to go on TV, help dogs get adopted. Yeah. Um, I was actually in the process with the whole mental health thing of being on a panel. Mm -hmm. Um, with these doctors and, you know, sharing my story as well to help other people out. Um, so when I got traded, it kind of uh, threw things up a little bit, a little bit uh, scrambled. But as of right now, I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to help everybody out, um, helping out with camps. Uh, my boy Andre Williams doing a little fundraiser uh, February 3rd. I got to get more information on that. Um, going to Tahoe, going to help out a little bit with the uh, Humane Society out there. They raise a ton of money uh, that night, um, but I just I'm just here just trying to you know help everybody out. I I received so much help to get to the point that I am here now. It's not right to give it back. So it's only right. It's only right. So that's my focus right now. But I for sure will definitely be getting to something um, more directly where I can definitely push because from the tri-state area, yep. I'm back home now. Now it's time to get balls rolling. Boom. Yeah. We love that. We appreciate you, bro. Uh, it's been a great episode, episode four. Yes. D1 Bound Podcast. Very much. With our special guest, Kevin Pierre Lewis, Patrick Ododina, Brian Ford. We out. 203. 203. 203, yes. <laughs> appreciate you, bro. I appreciate you, yeah. family. Thanks a lot. Uh, you done so? You're smacked. <laughs> I'm over here.